very much, Andrew. So, folks, this is we have the privilege, the challenge, and the well, yes, it is a challenge of uh, having a very broadly scoped topic, but we're going to be exciting, lively, and vibrant, and we need you. We need you to participate in that. So lots of interaction, please, from everybody. Let me um, introduce my panel first of all. And going from the right here, we have Andrew Spooner, who's UX evangelist at Microsoft. We have Jenny Tennyson, who is CTO at the Open Data Institute. To my left, we have Scott Jensen, who does user experience at Google. And who's next? Oh, it's uh, Tom over there. Uh, Tom Ashworth is front-end developer over at Twitter, and Alice on the end there does user experience stuff for the government digital service. Um, I think we are... <laughs> I'm so sorry. I'm carried away in my own excitement. Um, we'll probably cover some themes that have already been covered today, but I'm hoping we'll cover them from a slightly different perspective. So uh, we've already talked, for example, about varying device sizes and so on. Um, but we, we are looking for broadening that topic out, I guess, and looking to future case. Remember, we're talking about the future, so every opinion is valid. Well, <laughs> nearly every opinion. Uh, I, I'm trying hard to let go of that reference to being older than make. What do you think? <laughs> Actually, is, is Gareth here? Is he still here? The guy who said that? No, he ran off. He ran off. Well, just collectively, everyone here is over 37 would wish him to say, just fuck you. <laughs> <laughs> I, I want to, just to um, verify my own antiquity, I want to make sure that you understand my first build system was, in fact, a shoebox. Uh, which helped me to keep the punched cards in order. <laughs> uh, the other thing I want to say in this rather lengthy preamble before I introduce you, uh, Jenny is that um, you've heard people say when they've been asked to ask their questions, oh, um, this isn't what I wrote. I'm expecting that quite a few people who I call on will say, I have no idea what this even means. <laughs> it bears no relation whatsoever to what I wrote down. Now, that, this, is, this is not... Um, we did actually try to keep it thematically coherent, so the people who are asking the questions may have some words in that... Dan's nodding there. there. There are some words in your question, Dan, that you did originally write. Not, in <laughs> not, it, not, not next to each other and not in the same order. <laughs> Right, so Jenny, Jenny, can you please tell us where next? Okay. <clears throat> so, can I have my slides up, please? Yes, no, maybe it's not plugged in. <laughs> it's on the screen here, it's just not on the screen there. Oh, do you need to? Maybe this is not plugged oh, in. Yeah, it's not plugged that in. Would be. Oh. That, that would help. Yeah. Maybe. <laughs> yeah. I know how I've got it set up. You want it to mirror? Thank you, there we go. Right, sorry for that slight delay. Um, right, so the topic of future web is a rather broad one, the future being very much longer than the past, um, hopefully. Uh, <laughs> God, what have I done there? Touch wood, right. Um, so, uh, so thinking about the future web, um, obviously the first person to ask about where the web might go would be uh, Chrome, come on. <laughs> so this is not good. Okay. I think I might need to use it. This is using uh, reveal.js, by the way. Um, thank you. 
<laughs> we do need a future plan. So. Sorry about this. Uh, Derek, it's alternative. What did you do to my computer? I don't know. Are living in the future. Um, <laughs> excellent. That looks much better. Do you want to try it? Oh, it's not up on it's not up on the screen now. There we go. There we go. Okay, dokey. Right. Okay, yes, nice. looks better. Right. Thank you. Um, so let's ask Timbal now. Of course. Uh, um, thinking about asking Timbal what the future of the web holds, of course he did his uh, Ask Me Anything on Reddit, um, where he was asked what was one of the things that you never anticipated about the internet, and famously replied, kittens. So um, in terms of predicting what's going to happen in the future web, I can predict that there will still be kittens on the web and pussies too. <laughs> but I want to focus on... <laughs> Three themes, three trends that um, I think are going to be important as we go forward as web developers and look at those in terms of what that means for us uh, when we're developing web applications. Um, those three themes are going to be more sensitivity around our personal information, more data being available, and as we've touched on many times today, more devices. So, more sensitivity, first of all. Um, Ed Snowden. The, the thing that, one of the things that has happened recently that has changed the way in which we think about the web is the revelations around uh, that Ed Snowden um, came about what the <coughs> NSA is looking at, what GCHQ is looking at. And um, I, I found this on Wikipedia, a fantastic little diagram. Uh, SSL added and removed here. This is the stuff that we can get into, guys, at the, at the back end of, of, of Google, where there's no encryption and um, we have free reign. Um, what does this mean in terms of how we design our systems, our web applications? What does it mean in terms of it, the, these revelations, this, this thinking about where our private information is going? What does that mean for us? Well, there's loads of policy implications, loads of uh, things that we can think of at a legislative level or a policy level. But there are also some technical ones. Um, I'm on the... Uh, technical architecture group at the W3C and one of the things that has come up several times without any kind of resolution or um, in-depth thinking is what we do around permissions on the web where uh, how do we balance the need for you to know that you are being looked at through your video camera on your um, laptop with it not being right so much in your face that you cannot interact with whatever the application is. How do we balance up the need to request on a case-by-case uh, -case basis uh, information about your location with the irritation of being requested on a case-by-case -case basis about your location? Um, how do we get around these terrible kinds of permission uh, interfaces that everybody just clicks through and ignores? Everybody being everybody who doesn't wear a temporal hat, that is. Um, so... That's one set of kind of questions. How do we handle those permissions when we have lots of ways of tracking us? Another um, area that I wanted to raise was uh, how do we move away from these centralised services that are so vulnerable to um, a single uh, that are a single point of failure, if you like, in our in our uh, private data. Um, so I'm particularly interested in a couple of activities that are going on around this, around unhosted web apps, the idea of having a web application over here that operates on data over here, um, and you can control how your data gets accessed by that web app. It doesn't actually hold all your data itself. And also the work of Redecentralize, which explores a lot of these issues, and I'd encourage you to, to have a look at. How do we get to a web that isn't as centralised as it currently is because of these sensitivities that we have um, about our personal data being collected in huge databases which are vulnerable to attack? So that was my first area. Second area... 
um, is about data. Now, so far during the day, the focus has really been on what happens within a browser context. Where I work at the Open Data Institute, all I hear about is data. Um, all I hear about is smart cities and the data that you can get from devices and sensors within a road network in smart cities. This is smart city logo land, right? Um, we talk about home automation and the extra information we can get about our homes, um, interactions with home systems, sensors, more data coming in from, from our home systems. We talk about quantified self, um, wearable computing that monitors us constantly, that provides streams and streams of data. Mm -hmm. We talk about open data, naturally, at the Open Data Institute, more government data being made <coughs> available, also from companies, data being made available that we can all use. We talk about big data, massive amounts of uh, fast-moving, uh, variable data. Um, I love the way that in my search for big data, see that McDonald's sign? <laughs> Why? I don't, I don't know. Anyway, um, data. So we talk about medical data, defence data, dicker data, whatever that is. Morning data, noon data, afternoon data, the night data. Everything is data. So um, what does this mean for the web when we have so much more data being passed around? H there's so much more streaming data, so much more big data. HTTP as a protocol is not good for this kind of streaming. It's not good for these kinds of big files. So what other protocols are we using? What other protocols do we need? Um, and how do we make them play nicely with the web? Okay. How do we make them play well with HTML pages and HTTP? Um, the web was made for documents. Um, <laughs> Uh, so, is JSON the pinnacle of data on the web? Um, is, is JSON really all that we need for expressing data on the web? I don't think so. Um, the other question I'd like to raise is what does a native, web, uh, da native data browser look like? What happens currently when you have uh, data that's made, made available on the web is that, that um, you have to create your own kind of component, your own kind of visualization. We have things like this, which are uh, data tables, JavaScript plugin that makes everything um, that, that stream stuff, uh, streams data in, that makes it sortable, filterable, pageable, and so on. Um, but what about moving to more, uh, more integrated data and documents using the kinds of technologies within D3? What does this mean for us on the web? What kinds of components, what kinds of web components could we build that natively work with data? Those are the kinds of questions that I think are interesting for the future. Third area, more devices. This is the area that we've touched on loads today. Um, so we have a browser that stopped working again. Come on. More devices. Give me it. Come on. <laughs> okay, so we have more devices that don't work. Um, oh, that is inter completely interaction. Okay, um, more devices. Hey, right. hey, um, light, uh, phones, tablets. Yes, that's a Windows tablet. Um, <laughs> TVs, uh, watches, fridges, um, <laughs> cars. Um, and all of these devices have differences in their size, in their resolution, in their connectivity in their processing power, in their modes of interaction, as we've already talked about, and in their context of use. Huge variety, 
massive variety of ways in which we as humans will interact with the web. Um, and of course, that means that we need this like responsive design plus plus, right? Not only uh, responsive layout, but responsive images, responsive interactions, changing by in the way, uh, changing based on the devices that we use. Responsive storage, different ways of storing the information and knowing whether you're going to go on and offline um, uh, intermittently or whether you're going to have a, a constant internet connection. For example, will change the way in which we design our web applications. Um, right, and a final thought. Uh, we're currently dominated by four particular web browsers and um, fewer rendering engines. Um, well, okay. <laughs> and perhaps we should be dominated by one more. Yeah, all right. So, okay. It's bling. <laughs> it's bling. It's the same. So, rendering engine. So, my, my closing question would be, are we agile enough, right? Have we got enough small pieces loosely joined to enable us to adjust to a changing future? Um, can the web that we know it be disrupted by the next best thing? Or have we built something that um, is too big to be taken down? Okay, so, thank you. Woo. Thank you very much, Jenny. I, um, I anticipate a future in which Jenny will give a presentation using web technology with fewer than three different <laughs> browsers. <laughs> but I don't expect it'll come soon. <laughs> right. Um, Jenny, thank you. That was great. Uh, and hopefully we can follow up on some of your themes through some of the questions that we have put through the ringer. Uh, for the final time today, at least in this role, I'm going to call on Andrew Betts. <laughs> <laughs> this time to read a question that he had nothing to do with. Uh, that is very true, actually. And I, I have no more questions, I promise you. Uh, what is the role of the web in the world of wearables with no screen? Okay, so the question is, what is the role of the web in a world with wearables with no screen? This is a reference to the fact that the web is primarily a visual thing in its output at least. We've talked about different input modalities. What about different output modalities? Jenny, do you want to kick us off on this one? Oh, right, okay. <laughs> Just recovering. Oh, I'm um, sorry. No. <laughs> Jenny, okay. calm down. <laughs> right. um, so, uh, it, it's one of my bugbears that we, um, we focus on uh, browsers, uh, we focus on screens, and we don't think about the other ways in which um, all sorts of all sorts of agents might interact on the web. Um, and I think wearables is just one kind of example of this. There are, but there are lots of other kinds of agents that we need to be need to be thinking about and understand that they live on the web too, and they consume web content too. Um, when we, yeah. Um, so, it, wearables, you've got a difference in uh, input modality, but you've also got an, a difference in output modality, which I think changes the way in which we need to um, uh, think about how we design our pages in the same way as we talked about accessibility issues in the, in the last session. Sorry, that wasn't very... No, that was great. Okay. Thank you. Um, Alice, I know that you've done a, a lot of work in the Internet of Things. How, yeah. how does this strike you in, in that context? Well, I mean, I think it's... I think I think it's the web is going to continue uh, in the way it currently does in a world without screens because, as Jenny said, uh, there are already plenty of things that don't have screens, um, and there'll be new things that don't have screens, and some of those will be um, objects that we currently understand, um, like watches, that have a sort of additional have been elevated by having the web put into them, but then there might be some completely new invented things that are uh, a middle ground that you would never have thought about before you were able to put the web into sort of stuff. And there are, you know, like I used to work for Berg and so we made Little Printer and Little Printer is, we made a mistake by calling it Little Printer because it's not, well it is a printer but that's not like its primary function. Um, and you would never really want that with Little Printer without the internet. Um, and in that way, it's sort of a new product rather than like an internet fridge or something like that. But Little Printer doesn't have a screen unless you count the receipt paper that it prints on as a screen, um, which it, you know, we, 
we mischievously say it is sometimes. Thanks for that. I, I go ahead, I Scott. Just poke fun at the community a little bit, though, because right now I don't think that this that the web community even can get its head wrapped around the web on a watch, <laughs> let alone a web not on a screen at all. Yeah. Um, there's this. I think the web has never recovered from the fact that screens started getting smaller. Or bigger. It, no, no, I mean, they continually got bigger, and it basically just immediately just didn't worry about things. And then when it reversed direction, we collectively lost our minds. And we still haven't, and we still haven't recovered from that. And so this idea that we have to have one size fits all works great as long as you're willing to scroll everything 20 pages. But if you want to have, a, I hate to get into the web app versus web page thing because it's a waste of, you know, but the fact is that we are trying to make things that are more interactive, and the web has not got its head wrapped around that quite yet. And so I do think we have a lot of soul searching to do to figure out what interaction means on multiple devices. Okay, um, so uh, to summarize some of the points here, what we're saying is we haven't even got to grips with what we've got, but I would come back and say, hey, but you haven't seen anything yet, so we better hurry up and make up our minds about what we're going to do. I can see Remy on the queue. Let me take Remy and come back to you. <laughs> um, yes, this is, this is kind of linked to the question I had before, but um, I mean, you, you mentioned kind of poking web, fun at the web. I mean, mm. I don't get it, right? I don't get how my phone is of the web. It, it, it could, it can, I think, talk over TCP IP, and it can talk to a web server, but in a proprietary format. It's not, there's no webbiness that I can see there. There's no way of me getting into right. can it. Right, I'm going to cut you off there because we're going to come back to this as a topic later. So I'm I'll let you back time. in. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Fascinating though your point was. We will be coming back to it. it does it qualify as a web device? It's not a purely syntactic argument, I don't think. <laughs> Tom? Um, well, I, I think we as a web community have um, good things to say to the people who are building these wearable devices. We may not be able to uh, um, uh, put our technology stack on them. So, you know, you know, you're not going to find a headless web browser running on a Fitbit. But we can say if you make URLable resources available and connected to each other, uh, we know that's a good thing. We can point out to these, the people who are building these things that that has some really positive uh, benefits. And if we give things URLs and we make them addressable and we make them uh, accessible, even if they, um, you know, even if it's JSON and not HTML, but we use the principles of, of the web and to some extent the internet, then I think we can have a really positive impact as the web community on, on whatever comes over the next few years in terms of wearable devices and things that don't have, don't have screens. Okay, Andrew. Yeah, um, I, th I think to, to call uh, inherent to the web is the presentation format, that presentation layer. So to think of the web without a screen, I think it's a little bit weird. Um, Completely disagree. Um, carry on. That's, that's, that's good. Well, um, that's good. good. You yourself were talking about music and notation and so on. What's wrong with a web of music? Um, nothing's wrong with a web of music, but I think we've, we've got all of this data in a particular format that we can access, and we can use web languages uh, in order to talk to data and in order to talk to devices, but I don't see it as the web on those devices. Jenny, go on. Um, so the, the reason that I disagree is um, that for me, then, the web is... The, the, the main definition of the web is use of HTTP. It isn't the use of HTML. And if you count the use of HTTP, you can be sending data over, um, uh, over HTTP, which needn't be um, shown on a screen, which could be interacted with through a wearable device or, or in any other kind of way. Um, that we t if we tie uh, the web as only being HTML, I think we make a mistake. Yeah, I, I, I'm not getting into the protocols, but the, the, what the web is, is to me, it has, it has a presentation there, and it's something very visual. But we can certainly use the content, and we can use the languages that we've got in order to interact with devices. But maybe we're getting crossed. Right, OK. I think well, we, uh, we could continue on this, and I'm, I'm very sorry to everybody who's on the queue here, but we are going to move on to the next topic now, because we're, we've got too much to cover. We just have. Um, mm. I am going to call, again, I, possibly for the final time today, Christopher, you've been an active participant. I hope I didn't mangle your question beyond your ability to read it. Um, yeah, so I mean, if you let me to just preface this, the reason I'm kind of asking this question is I've actually recently had experience with this, but also when we talk about the future, we focus a little bit too much on the tech side and not about the audience side. 
So basically my question is, the future of the web will see a rising importance in optimizing sites for use in China and working with their national firewall. Many popular embeddable services such as YouTube are blocked over there. How do we accommodate different nationalities to privacy, sensitive content, and inappropriate content, and so on? And there's also the technological barriers to dealing with it as well. Jenny, I'm going to ask you to leap in here again, um, because this is, I think, directly keying off the, 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 one of your principal points. I, and about. I think it was also because nobody else wanted to touch it with a barge pole. <laughs> 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 um, so, uh, um, on the internet, then the typical way in which we move around those barriers is that we subvert them. That tends to be what happens. Um, we, we tend to work around those kinds of issues. Um, I, and I, I don't have direct experience of, of the, the issues in China, and I can't really speak to them. I think that the issues about how we um, internationally uh, co come up with some kind of understanding about how um, uh, when we have lots of different laws around privacy, around data protection, um, uh, and so on, how we internationally handle that is a, is a very interesting question. I've seen um, people uh, from Africa talk about um, wanting to have legislation in their countries that explicitly uh, precludes anybody looking at data within servers that are in their countries to make them a more attractive option for um, people who are, are building web app applications to, to use servers in their country, for example. So we might start to see an arms race between different nationalities as they try to provide a more interesting <coughs> web environment for people to use, maybe. The other kinds of things that I think are interesting, if you think about what um, Tim Ball said at the, at the uh, 25th anniversary of the web um, just the other week, uh, talking about a Bill of Rights for uh, internet users, whether we should have a right to use the internet, whether we should have a right to use it without, with, uh, with particular levels of um, understanding about what our privacy should be, what, our, what, our, what access we should have to content on the web. Um, or the other kind of idea that I've, had, uh, I've um, heard floating around is whether we should have a Geneva Convention type of thing, where we know that there are going to be states that block us from accessing certain kinds of content, but should we have an international understanding about the limits of, those, of that blocking that, that we internationally agree on? I think these are all really interesting questions. I think that these, we're only at the beginning of starting to have those conversations, particularly with policymakers who really don't understand any of this at all. And that's quite scary, really, isn't it? Mm. I think we also have to look at this question from, a, from another point of view, which is, that actually, th this is a moot point if, we, if the web is not viable in a, a con a, uh, any particular country. So, for example, in, I won't call them developing nations because their economies are bigger than, uh, our con uh, than the UK's, but in countries like Brazil or, say, China or India, we have to ask, is the web actually a viable platform there at the moment? If I, for example, work for a social network, and uh, let's say I work for Facebook and I want to... Um, <laughs> and I want to, uh, I, I want to get more users in a, in a country like uh, one of the ones I just mentioned. Mm. I've got a range of technologies that, uh, that are available to me. And honestly, as web people, we have to say, you know what, the web does not win in that battle. Native wins in that battle. Low-powered Android wins that battle. And oh, so, dear. And, no. and, 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 and actually, and actually okay, okay right. I'll, I'll give you, I'll give you Firefox, Firefox OS as well. But, but, <laughs> but, you, you, but you, you have, to, have to admit that I, I think for a big company, uh, if you're going to invest a, a, um, in a technology right now, low-powered low Android phones, particularly if you're heading into those markets, are a very good option. We are missing certain key elements of the technology stack that will enable us to um, make gains in, in those, those places. There were quite a few questions in the moderator, actually, about... Um, right. I'm going to cut you off there, because <laughs> I think that you've done your advertising spiel. Thank you very much for that. Can we go to Robert Daly, who's on the queue? Yeah. Hi, yeah. Um, we currently think of um, one device, one user, but with car OSs and basic giant touchscreens that will have multiple users using the same app at the same time, mm -hmm. How do we deal with, um, say, a driver and a passenger to, uh, using the same app in a car at the, at the same time without switching user accounts or, you know, as in 
as we deal with multiple people interacting with, with the web. Or indeed multiple, on one device. multiple people on single people on multiple devices, which that, is the other I, side of that problem. So do you yeah. want to take that one, Scott? I actually would add that. It just, I, I feel like that's exactly the issue the web has right now, is that we've been so enamored with sing, you know, one device and one screen that we just, that's just our entire myopia. I, I even go even further that that one screen has to, by the way, look and feel as much like an iPhone as possible. But that's, I'm being a little editorial at that point. Um, but I do think that the web needs to be exploring these kinds of things. So what would it mean to have something on my watch which then entices me to pull out my phone and allows me then to continue the experience? I don't think we're considering that. And it's something that, frankly, I think the web is most powerful at, cons at, at playing with. Uh, I, I okay, know. sorry, I'm going to have to skip to Guy and then we'll move on to the next topic. I just want to kind of get back to the country question and say that I, I don't think it's a foregone conclusion that the the web needs to adapt to those countries. I think to a large extent, the countries need to adapt to the web. And it's sort of a force to be reckoned with. And you know, Twitter and other platforms have already demonstrated that multiple times over the past few years. Um, and I think you know, in the, when you talk about the future of the web, it's very much possible that the future of the web is the openness of it. And it's kind of the government's problem to sort of figure out how do they navigate within that world. So, so the intent is about getting data from one place to the other, privacy concerns around that, et cetera. But, yeah, I, 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 I agree with that. I think. I'm really sorry about that. We, we were actually going to go light on the allotted time for that, but we've run out of time on it, despite thinking we were not going to spend as much on it as we might have done. Oh, well. Right, next topic. Daniel Applechrist, because I'm much nicer than Christian Heilman, I'm going to give you your question. Suck <laughs> up. <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, Oh, this isn't what I wrote. No. Um, <laughs> uh, so in its march towards increasing sophistication, and I think this question, parenthetically, this question kind of goes back to the more display browser-oriented web that we've been talking about for, um, it's not to discount the importance of the, of the data-oriented web, which I, I think is also important. But in, in its march uh, towards increasing sophistication is the web losing touch with being easy to learn and therefore accessible to a very broad authorship community. And I'm going to add one more parenthetical statement. I think this relates to the whole meme that's going on right now about teaching kids to code and getting kids, and especially young people, uh, engaged in development. How do we get them engaged in the web um, easily? OK, thank you, Dan. I'm going to re-paraphrase your question back to another fork of the question, if you like, which is it used to be terribly easy to write a basic web page. It was pretty shit, but it was very easy to do. That was an on-ramp. That point has been made uh, earlier today. But um, in order to be competitive or to provide a better user experience, things have got a lot more complicated. Have they got disproportionately complicated in order to achieve the objectives of being more sophisticated than they no. used to be? No. Yeah. yeah. No. <laughs> <laughs> right. Like, that's like, we, can, we can deal with this. Okay. No, 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 you no, can, no. Right. You can, like, back in the day, it was quite, still quite hard to get a web page onto a server, and not a lot of people were interested in doing it proportionately because it was quite a lot of effort because there wasn't this sort of corpus of like help and tutorials and stuff. And now you can do, you can get very, very far and do very cool stuff without knowing basically anything <laughs> and like that may or not may be a good thing or a bad thing but like it's not to say that we've made it too complicated for people is really doing people a massive disservice these people that are like oh i can't be bothered they always existed and they're still around and they still can't be bothered and then there are people who can be bothered and they also are s still being served by what we have um, and you can just go further and people who will say oh but it's possible for people to make like terrible mistakes and do really dangerous things. That's fine. Those people are going to learn really quickly <laughs> how to be better. And that's brilliant too. So this kind of like, yeah. The, hate they'll, learn, they'll learn really quickly, but possibly with disastrous consequences. Like, well, I mean, you know, so, I use this analogy, which is putting a chainsaw in the hands of a six-year-old. Either yeah. they learn or, well, you know, they don't. Um, <laughs> so I, I, I teach. Uh, people every week, mostly beginners. Um, in fact, go to every, uh, people who live in London, Code Bar, IO, minority people in tech, we're trying to promote, um, particularly women. Uh, so if you've got free time on Wednesdays, please come to that. But I teach, teach people every Wednesday, and um, I see this a lot. I see people who are coming 
new to HTML and new to CSS, and absolutely it is possible for them to go from zero and in an hour and a half have a huge smile on their face because they've just created their first website. There's absolutely no reason to believe that that's <laughs> fading away. Yeah, and also your planning when you started programming and doing things initially, I mean, in CSS, you say have an editor, you could actually write a page on that. And then when you wanted to do anything dynamic, did you see the first script that executed Actina Fascio? Are you sure that we can do anything more dangerous than that? I think we're yeah. talking. Uh, okay, yeah. okay, yeah. valid, Andrew. Um, I, I think as with uh, any uh, as any technology matures, uh, we realised that uh, some yeah, of the things that we used to do that were quite difficult to do, we we, we try and simplify those. Uh, if I think back when I started on the web, just trying to get. Uh, someone to uh, just trying to get data into a form and save that onto a server somewhere. That was actually quite a complicated task. It was quite a very, it took us a long time to do that. It was a very expensive thing to do. There's a lot of simple tools out there that allow people to do that quite easily now. And so whilst um, that's an easy thing to do, um, I think it means that some people don't understand what it is that they're actually, what's actually going on in the background. But then do you need to know what's going on in the background? So I look at my... Hopefully not. I just want to add to that a little bit and say um, I just recently started doing uh, code club, so I teach um, kids as young as five. How are you getting on? No, sorry. <laughs> 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 one, one day I hope to make a career out of this. Um, but I teach I teach kids as young as like five or six how to do programming, and the speed, the facility with which they pick up quite sophisticated concepts is incredible. And I think with the low barrier to entry that the web provides, I don't think we're in any danger of making that too complex at all. Okay. I think um, look, Linda has just oh, arrived done. from Code Club as we were speaking about it. So, um, so <laughs> yeah, without wishing to put to put words in in her mouth about what the mission of Code Club is, I mean it really fills a gap in education that that does exist, and there is a problem with that. And um, and so when you're talking about you know maybe you're talking about doing the co coming to the web as as like you know, a teenager who is looking to make their first web page, and then there's Code Club who is sort of enabling kids at a much younger age to get involved with technology and think about and programming in, in a way that just the, you know, the education system is And, and since we're talking about the future of the web, really groups like Code Club and um, Young Rewired State are making the future of the web, which is the people who make the web. So we should invest in those. Okay, thank you. We do need to push on here because I think we've probably only got time for two more things if, I'm, if we're going to stick to our timing. Um, so, Daniel, no danger there. Okay? Mm. Move, moving on. Um, from Ed S. Or, uh, uh, this Ed is Snowden. Ed Snowden. Ed Snowden. Uh, yes, uh, this was a combination of yours and someone else's. So this, it starts, just to, get, just to check, it starts, is the web? <laughs> okay, so I was, no. Uh, <laughs> giving this to ask on behalf of Ed Soden, or Soudan, could be. Um, but I think it's the question that Remy perhaps wanted to ask. And that it's is kind exactly, of been yeah. bubbling under a few of the conversations as well. It goes like this. Is the web going to grow into, all, into an all-encompassing platform for all future computing? Is there any area which will be spared? Or, <laughs> by contrast, is the future of the web just providing APIs for native applications to be built? Thank you. So this is a question about what are the limits of the web? What is the definition of the word web? I don't think we probably want to go that way, but you know, you guys started having a little <laughs> bit of a hammer and tongs about that earlier. Would you like to continue that in, this, in the context of this question? So will the web grow into an all-encompassing com computation platform? Jenny, you say no, because some things that are inherently web-like, like HTTP, are not suitable. Yeah, so I think the, the basic... Um how I would define the web, which would be about uh, the use of HTTP and the use of um, resources identified by URLs, um, takes us a long way, but there are some, there are some aspects of uh, particularly um, data flows on the internet that don't use web protocols and should not use web protocols. And we need to be thinking outside of the, of the HTTP as the only protocol that we ever use on the internet. So, Andrew. Uh, well, um, so is this also about languages and how we can extend languages to other 
You can make it platforms because <laughs> thank you. Um, <laughs> I, I, I see the web. We've invested so much time in it. We've invested so much time putting the content into a format that we can access, um, and we can do so much more with uh, languages like JavaScript nowadays that, we, that, that they're actually starting to stand up to other languages. So the web can uh, exist in almost anything. If I think about some of the development work I do at the moment, um, using JavaScript to access the same APIs that I can do through C++ or that I could do through C Sharp, um, when creating uh, applications for Windows 8, for instance. They use, I'm using the same web technologies and the same web languages. So are you uh, saying that the distinction is a bogus distinction in some ways? You're saying everything flows into everything else? I, I, I think, I think it, it, can, it, can, it can exist okay. in places where we don't have it currently, yes. Remy, is, is, I'm hoping this was adjacent to the point that you were making. No, I don't Absolutely think. nothing to do with it. Uh. It's not so much nothing to do with it. I just don't. I don't think the web will be everything, and I don't think it will just be yeah. the eyes. So I think, like, to I agree with what you're saying. I think there's a lot of like, there's a lot of hype around the Internet of Things. There's a lot of hype around smartwatches and all that stuff. And I think there are a lot of companies that are doing a lot of figuring out through doing at the moment. And what we'll find in in ten years, well, no, not ten years, five years. Um, is there'll be the, the web will be in some stuff and it'll make a lot of sense and everybody will be like, check out my cool web enabled thing. And then it won't be in other stuff and people will be like, remember when we tried to put the internet in fucking fridges? That was madness. <laughs> <laughs> and like, you know, but there's, there's a lot of hype and a lot of marketing stuff that makes all of this seem like, like people are seriously thinking about this when actually they're just figuring stuff out and, you know, some of it is I seriously challenge that in the sense, I'd go back to the audience in a second, um, in the sense that I'm old enough uh, to have said 15 years ago, do you know what, people are going to be using these devices here to do all kinds of cool stuff on the move, and people said, yeah, 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 we'll wait to see that. So I, I, I think that expressing scepticism about the direction that these technologies will so take I, I, is a potentially dangerous <coughs> route to take. I, I, oh, well, I let's not JavaScript. have any scepticism then. Yeah. I, I, so, <laughs> <laughs> so, but, that wasn't yeah, my point. But, <laughs> believe me, I, I write JavaScript all day, every day, and quite frankly, I do not want JavaScript on a pacemaker. I do not <laughs> want... <laughs> <laughs> I just, like, if, if you said to me, look, here's a web-enabled thing that's going in your body, I would tell you to fuck <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. If, uh, if Microsoft mm. Yeah, we actually have, there's actually examples of what we tried to do once uh, when there was Nokia Series 40 thing. We tried to do an interpreter for doing things running on a device that basically you couldn't even fit a JavaScript interpreter on. Because I don't know if you remember, but JavaScript, apart from having obvious limitations regarding how we handle numbers, etc., requires, <laughs> requires quite a bit of stack, etc. And we ended up doing the first gadget engine thing that we built in this company in uh, Scheme. In a Scheme, because it was the smaller interpreter that we could fit in like approximately 4K. Right, so there would be things, as we were saying, that basically you cannot use the HTML, CSS for actually making your interface simpler, and you cannot use JavaScript to kind of reuse what you had been doing because literally there's no space. So not only because of the whole asynchronous thing, but because technically some of these things in the Internet of Things are not even going to have a stack to run JavaScript on, okay. nor to use HTTP for that matter. Christian, you had a word you wanted to interject, and then we're going to probably have to move on. One thing is about, what amazes me is we talk about HTTP, but then we're actually using a system here that uses WebSockets, and we're using a system that uses WebRTC and has peer-to-peer -peer connections that could even be encrypted between two computers so that companies starting with N and ending with SA couldn't actually <laughs> listen to us. Mm -hmm. uh, I find it also interesting that we, when I started on the web, what I loved most about it is that I can use whatever I want to actually start connecting with it. And now we're talking about smartwatches, glasses that cost $1,500, mm -hmm. basically <laughs> toys for the Western world to be mm. the, the future of the web. And to me, the future of the web lies in, as you said, emerging markets with more people than we have. Mm. And fixing that to gadgets that are closed in one environment is, to me, the wrong way of making the future of the web. Mm -hmm. Okay, so cl a closing comment from the panel here. Scott, have you got something to say on this? Well, I'm... I'm intrigued with how we want this future to go because there's clearly the discussion about how the standards bodies work but I would argue that the vast majority of the conversations that I tend to have with people is all about well how can you make this web page scroll on a small screen and, I mean, and, and, and so I think to a certain extent we've trapped ourselves in our own paradigm which is that these are just scrolling web pages and I think that there's so much more the web can do and for example the previous question about multi-displays 
there's so, and I, I don't want to aspire to be what the iPhone was five years ago. Right. And I think the web can do so much more than that. Isn't right. a big okay. issue that we still say it should look the same everywhere? That's I, what I always uh, have to fight. This is, this is a little off topic, I, I don't guys. agree with that, but yeah. <laughs> Sorry. So I'm sorry, but we're going to close that. Oh, that's my job. I quite enjoy it, actually. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, we have a final question, which is going to set us, uh, I think, down the path, actually, that uh, you were on just now, Scott. So we'll, we'll let you continue on that one. From Andre Behrens. Hi, this is Andre's question. Um, web developers and even corporations that are outside the browser vendor community have a feeling of being a prisoner to decisions others make with often limited means to address certain problems. Who should be determining the future of the web and how? So, who should be determining the future of the web and how? Well, I assume this is the whole extensible web manifesto discussion. It can be. It can be. Um, <laughs> I still feel that our biggest issue is our own myopia of what we think is important because the vast majority of this community is just trying to figure out and argue about apps versus native. And so to me, I would like the web community to start to figure out a way to experiment with these new things. Like, how would I write a web app to work across multiple, app, multiple displays? I'd have to roll everything from scratch. And I just don't think that we're talking about ways to encourage that kind of experimentation. It seems to be so standards driven now that we've lost the ability to kind of do stupid shit, and I'd like to do more of it. Okay. <laughs> you carry on doing more stupid <laughs> shit. I'll talk to <laughs> someone else. <laughs> Sorry. I'm just kidding. Jenny, people, uh, the view expressed here is that people uh, don't have a sufficient voice in the process. Um, so I think the web is what we, what we build. It's what we, what we make. Um, it's through experimentation. Um, and that we, we have a responsibility, if we want our voice to be heard, step up and, and, uh, and shout. Um, so I, I think that the, the, in terms of standardization, I think the W3C has done a lot to try and open up discussion through ad adding community groups, for example, over the past few years. Um, uh, but uh, I do think that there is a massive gap between developers that are in this room here and the majority of web developers out there who probably do feel that they have no role in the conversation. Um, so, so can I just ask for a little straw poll here? Out of everybody in this room here, who has actually, or who does, participate in um, particularly the W3C process? Okay. <laughs> So, who spec for the, or specifically W3C? Yeah, specifically W3C, uh, I think, since uh, we're talking about the web, and I guess I'm making the uh, web and W3C a kind of, well, it needn't be. So, does, is the W3C the future guardian of web? Uh, well, that's another question, I guess. Someone could, uh, someone could ask it. Um, what I think is the view that is expressed here is that, um, it, that that's not working um, um, particularly well. Um, um, but I, I think everybody in this room, everybody who contacts a browser vendor and asks them to fix a bug, asks them to add a feature, you've all got a voice in this. They're all listening. I know that there was, I can't remember the exact numbers, X thousand of uh, bugs reported uh, uh, to the Internet Explorer team. And there's a team of hundreds of people sitting there listening to those, implementing those changes. So if you're sending your requests in, there's people listening to it. And ultimately, um, I, I think everyone in this room has a chance to, to input into I, where it goes. I would, I would ask if you've had experience of that. Because um, just to get to the, for, for some examples, um, I, I, there was a bug, there's a bug in Firefox from about 2002, 2003 to do with um, uh, fragment identifiers in iframes. Um, it, was, it was opened in 2003. I bumped it a year and a half ago. Somebody else had bumped it about three years before that. No, nothing from, from Mozilla. Um, in terms of Internet Explorer, I, I don't know who to talk to. Um, I don't know how I can how I can get at those people. Apple, we all know the story there. You're right. <laughs> the the and, and for example, when the the developer tooling um, guys were up, both of the people who represented people who were working on these things, when asked how do we contribute, kind of shrunk up and 
okay, wrung their hands. I, I just don't think it's true that go, these go, are kind go, of friendly to, environments. Um, connect uh, connect.microsoft.com where you can um, uh, you can submit your requests and there's people, there's paid Microsoft employees who will then respond to you and say, right, yes, we know about this. Or say, we, uh, this isn't a feature we're interested in implementing. And you'll get a response from a human being through that. And there's loads of people in there who are, who are okay, responding let's, to Okay, let's go to the audience on this. We've got someone at the back, we've got Guy, and then, uh, hang on a second, let's go to the back first. Uh, hi, I'm kind of biased on this, uh, but I think that out of the four rendering engines that uh, we saw at the beginning, three of them are open source. So uh, basically people can either work on the engines themselves or find someone who will do this for them. And the reason I'm biased because I I'm currently work I started a crowdfunding uh, effort yesterday to add feature, uh, the picture element to Blink. So, and I think that the future should have more of that, more people adding features to the open source render again. Okay. Uh, coming forward in the room, Guy. I think that's a pretty high barrier <coughs> to entry though, isn't it? Yeah. For most web developers. Yes, I, mean, yeah. I, I, that is it. That, as a suggestion, it seems well, like. Yeah, I mean, if, if we, we, the Sensible Web Manifesto has been mentioned, if, if we work towards that ideal where we um, expose more of the kind of primitives that are there in the browsers but we currently have no access to, if we expose them to developers, then we, I think we stand a chance of, of being able to at least iterate more quickly towards an, uh, an API that we can then standardize. Um, I think uh, given the choice between downloading and, you know, Patching Chrome myself, or just working around a problem, I would work around it like yeah. Yeah. Mm. pragmatically. So as a I think so. My comment is actually a little <laughs> different. <laughs> it's a little different to sort of you know in general the notion of, of, of where does the web evolve, and I think we're losing sight of the server side. Like we keep talking about the clients and those components, but I think the future of the, of the web lies a lot with the services consumed on it, and I think clearly all these things and all these devices are part of the technology, but what you can do on the web, especially in the developing world or you know, in the access to banking or facilities or payments via the, uh, the phone or you know, ordering your groceries or calling a cab, uh, all of those components I think are a big part of the future of the web. So the fact that it might still be HTML or maybe we're not evolving it is you know, sometimes less critical versus the creativity or the uh, uh, just disruptions that happen on the business side of it, on the server mm -hmm. side of it. Okay, can we drop the one row forwards, I think? Yeah. Oh, okay, two rows forwards. Thank you. <laughs> uh, in terms of like, um, having an input, which is what uh, Andrew was talking to you about getting in touch with people, I found an inconsistency in SVG. I wrote a blog post about it. I managed to get in touch with one of the editors of the SVG spec. I showed him the thing. He's updating the SVG spec to fix that thing. It does mm. happen. It does work. It is out there, and you can get involved in it. <coughs> okay. Go, go right to the back, uh, and then we'll start to close down. Uh, so we can have examples of times when community input has worked. What we need is an example of when it hasn't, right? When the will of the community has not been exerted over browser vendors. Um, so maybe an example of that might be DRM. An example might be DRM, where okay. it's going in browsers, and generally speaking, that's not what people want. Okay, fine. I, 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 I want to ask Natasha, who's sitting right in the front here, <laughs> <laughs> and put her on the spot, because I know that she has something interesting to say about when people are invited to take part, they don't. What, to W3C in specific? Yes. Well, I'm, I'm, I've been very fortunate with con uh, contributing to W3C. I co-chair a, um, a group, and um, I, I'm actually filling Joe's shoes right now, which is pretty tough, but, um, but given all I've got. Not but we, we, need, we need people to help out, and we're so grateful if people want to help out. And I, we, we know there's a membership issue there, um, but, but if you want to help out on what we're doing in, in the web group, then please come, come and speak to us. There's uh, lots of the W3C guys are moving to using open tools like GitHub and, um, and uh, Twitter. We have a Twitter account, and of course the, the W3C is open anyway. Um, so if you want to contribute, you, you can, and, and, and please come and speak to me about that later at the party. I'll be very happy to, to Thanks, speak to you Natasha. about that. Thanks, um, Natasha. Okay, so the answer to the question, Tom, do you have well, something I, I just, to add uh, that? Yeah, the, the mention of DRM um, 
is interesting. It's not an area I know anything about, so I'm not going to speak specifically to DRM. But the um, idea of people who have a vested interest in that kind of technology encroaching on, say, issues of net neutrality is something that I think is really important for us to talk about. I mean, if we're talking about the future of the web, we're talking about a situation where I have to pay you know, my, uh, my ISP for a group of websites that I'm allowed to visit, and I have to extend that package you know, for just five ninety nine a month. To, to get access to this other search engine or this, you know, this, this website that wasn't on their original list and they couldn't, you know, they, they, uh, there was some kind of, mm -hmm. uh, you know, hostility between the two parties or whatever. And, and we there's, had, we there's had, a bigger community. We had a question that we had to yeah. skip exactly on this yeah. topic, I'm afraid. But, well, there's, so. a, there's a bigger community that needs to be involved in that. The web community is a small part of the group of people who are involved in m ensuring we keep the kind of net, or, or maintain the kind of net neutrality that we wish to have. And it's not my area of expertise, but I just, I, I sometimes feel like we sort of close ourselves in and, and say, well, well, let's keep the web bit of this good, you know, the HTML, CSS, JavaScript, that stack. Let's keep this, this good. As long as we look after this, everything else will be fine. Sometimes I wish we could take a step back and say, well, you know what, maybe we could stop worrying about that for a bit and say, let's get the, the people who work on the networking hardware and do, who, who do all these other aspects and bring us all together to make sure we can, going forward, keep, keep the, the web and the internet in the way we'd like it to be. OK, thank you. Now, this is unscripted. Alice, and uh, down the line, in three words then, to close this out here. <laughs> what is the future of the web? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Tom. What um, an excellent response from that. That's brilliant. <laughs> Kids. Freedom, <laughs> <laughs> help, <laughs> Scott. Uh, I don't know. Lots of arguing. <laughs> <laughs> Andrew, I'm going to give the privilege of being last. Oh, I just say connected. Just connected, connected, connected. Everything connected. connected. Okay, Jenny. Uh, Redecentralisation, because just because I like that word. <laughs> um, <laughs> and data. And so data. Okay. Thank you very much to our mm. panel.